listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 21st, 2017, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, rhinitis, a primer for specialists. Our presenter is Dr. Mark Dykowitz. He's in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the St. Louis University School of Medicine. You know, you're old when you you remember the endowed professors uh, from uh, St. Louis University, and he's going to speak to us on rhinitis, a primer for specialists. So, Dr. Dykowitz, please go ahead. Thank you. It's a, a great pleasure to be with you this morning, and we're going to talk about a topic that uh, deals with rhinitis, obviously one of the most uh, common things that we deal with. But there's actually a lot of tweaking that we can do in our care with patients. I'm also going to be presenting some highlights from uh, new guidelines that are coming out uh, and that are actually right now in press. Uh, here are my disclosures, none relevant to presentation. Our objectives are to better distinguish between allergic and non-allergic forms of rhinitis and differential considerations, to better select pharmacologic monotherapy and combination therapy for allergic and non-allergic rhinitis, and to better understand uh, the process and deliberations used to establish these uh, aforementioned recently evidence-based guideline recommendations for rhinitis. So this is the overall outline of our lecture. We'll talk about definition, importance, allergic versus non-allergic rhinitis, differential considerations, and then diagnosis with a fair amount of concentration on treatment. The definition uh, technically is characterized by symptoms rather than the itis aspect of it. Uh, by definition, rhinitis is nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, either anterior and posterior, sneezing and itching. You might say, well, itis should mean inflammation, but although that's present in allergic rhinitis, that's IgE mediated, of course, it's not so in some types of non-allergic rhinitis, which constitute a good percentage of patients, maybe 30 to 50 percent of patients presenting with symptoms of rhinitis. Rhinitis is very prevalent. Overall, it's the sixth most prevalent chronic illness and actually one of the most common uh, chronic conditions in children. Uh, and its prevalence does vary between uh, kids and adults, but there's no doubt it's a very commonly encountered disorder. It's also important to consider that rhinitis is not only a prevalent disorder, but is associated with comorbidities and appropriate management of rhinitis can be important to the effective management of some of these coexisting or complicating respiratory conditions such as asthma, sinusitis, and sleep apnea. On top of this, uh, the costs of rhinitis are substantial, and this is both due to the direct cost for treating it as well as the indirect cost to society because of people missing work or school or being present and not being very productive. If you look at uh, major contributors of total costs of health-related so-called absenteeism and presenteeism, again, being at work or school and not uh, doing so well, from a work standpoint, if you're looking at the uh, uh, y-axis, the mean productivity loss per employee per year versus all sorts of chronic conditions, you see in the first column there, allergic rhinitis and hay fever, uh, by this estimate, was number one. And this is greater than things like uh, depression or even on the far right there, uh, asthma. You can broadly state that rhinitis can be allergic, non-allergic, or mixed, where there's a combo of the two. And the approximate proportion of these three groups is one-third, one-third, one-third. Now, this is from the 2008 uh, Joint Task Force Practice Parameter which I just uh, recommend to you if you do want to look through all the details of the different types of rhinitis, they are listed here. I am only going to be highlighting several of these that are most important, but uh, be mindful, as you see from the list, there's lots of things that can cause nasal symptoms. Speaking of allergic rhinitis, the most common thing that we deal with, uh, of course, this is uh, due to IgE antibody responses 
Common allergic triggers can include pollens, which are seasonal in temperate regions of the country. On the other hand, there are certain age areas, such as, let's say, California, where grass can be an issue throughout much of the year. Uh, of course, also molds, uh, which can be indoors or outdoors, and then uh, indoor allergens, such as dust mites, pets, cockroaches, and mice or rats. Now, there are some differences in terminology that can get confusing. Uh, seasonal and perennial are, I think, by American uh, perspectives, fairly straightforward. That is traditionally what the FDA has used for assessing treatment uh, efficacy. But um, the Joint Task Force has also pointed out that episodic environmental allergic rhinitis can occur where people are getting exposed to agents that they normally don't get exposed to in their day-to-day -day environment. That can have some implications on the choice of medications for management. And also, the um, ARIA guidelines uh, brought up the concept that uh, some patients have intermittent or persistent uh, rhinitis, and that can make a difference with your selection of agents as well. Occupational environments can cause problems either through allergic or non-allergic mechanisms. Now, you can sort of go further into this uh, as to which populations of rhinitis you're talking about. The reason this may be very important down the road is you may be looking at different subsets of patients that would end up doing better with certain treatments than others. Um, so it, this is sort of a, a little bit of a reiteration and um, further explanation of what I had in the previous slide, but if you look at how allergic can be allergic rhinitis can be classified. It can be based on the temporal pattern, seasonal, perennial, or episodic environmental. The strict definition by aria of intermittent and persistent rhinitis is there. Intermittent strictly is defined as having symptoms less than four days per week or less than four weeks per year versus persistent, which is greater than four days per week and greater than four weeks per year. Um, there is the use of these terms, but I think in general, even the ARIA update uh, guidelines that we're talking about are talking about seasonal and perennial uh, allergic rhinitis. In general, you can um, say that if you're talking about more severe rhinitis, this is when symptoms are interfering with quality of life, including sleep, impairment of activities of daily living, uh, school, and work. Now, non-allergic rhinitis is something that has problems with terminology and is not as straightforward as we would like. Um, there certainly can be infectious uh, causes of uh, non-allergic rhinitis, viral upper respiratory infections, and then also um, various types of uh, chronic non-allergic rhinitis that are non-infectious. You'll see terms bantered about, and to some extent, these are not always mutually exclusive. Some of these are. Um, perennial non-allergic rhinitis, uh, vasomotor rhinitis, and idiopathic rhinitis, depending on which guideline you're looking at, can refer to the same group of patients. Uh, non-allergic rhinitis with eosinophilia syndrome is where there is significant um, eosinophilic inflammation of the uh, uh, nasal mucosa um, in the absence of apparent allergy. And I would say the whole definition of uh, non-allergic rhinitis is under evolution. And a number of years back, the National Institutes of Health had a workshop on non-allergic rhinitis and um, uh, put forth some classifications and definitions, but this is still a, a moving target. Now. Perennial non-allergic rhinitis, also known as vasomotor rhinitis, also known as idiopathic. Uh, you're not dealing with eosinophilic inflammation. Generally, you've got fewer treatment options. Uh, it can have a less favorable natural course than allergic rhinitis. And symptoms can be quite variable in an individual patient, ranging from obstruction, congestion, to rhinorrhea. Um, if you're looking, though, from a historical standpoint about trying to distinguish allergic from non-allergic rhinitis, sneezing, nasopritis, and eye symptoms are less common in uh, the non-allergic rhinitis forms, most of them, except with that Neri's syndrome um, with eosinophilia, you can see some of those uh, symptoms more commonly. 
Now, vasomotor retinitis is a terminology that's uh, somewhat problematic. Sometimes it's used globally to refer to all non-allergic rhinitis other than Neri's, but also it is used sometimes with the connotation that the nasal symptoms are being provoked by non-allergic factors. For instance, uh, changes in the external environment of the patient. And the FDA is saying, well, maybe these are even different subgroups of patients, people who are bothered by sudden temperature changes that provoke uh, nasal symptoms, uh, those that develop symptoms upon exposures to odors and irritants, such as perfumes and cleaning solutions, passive cigarette smoke. Um, also, the vasodilation effect of alcohol and other people who have problems uh, when they get more nasal symptoms with exercise, sexual arousal, or emotional factors. As we've already mentioned, mixed rhinitis can refer to patients who have both these non-allergic sorts of triggers and allergic triggers. And there are some people that really don't manifest a lot of these non-allergic triggers causing problems uh, unless they're having a flare-up of their allergic symptoms. Speaking a bit more about NARIs, um, this can be fairly common among adults with non-allergic rhinitis. Uh, uh, anosmia is quite common. It's thought that the patients with this disorder can have more severe symptoms than those with vasomotor rhinitis or allergic rhinitis. And in some patients, there's evidence that uh, there can be evolution to nasal polyposis and aspirin sensitivity. It does respond, though, relatively well to intranasal steroids. I do want to introduce the concept, which I think is still being um, researched and defined about local allergic rhinitis. Sometimes it's called nasal entopy. This is where there's been reports that local IgE production may occur within the nasal mucosa, but without uh, concomitant positive skin tests or in vitro serum tests for specific IgE. Patients have been reported to have positive nasal allergen challenges and to report, uh, they've been reported to benefit from allergen immunotherapy. Uh, I've given you some references if you want to look at this. Uh, I think um, guidelines are uh, raising this uh, uh, issue uh, as something to consider in patients, but there's also a need uh, for larger, well-controlled trials uh, with both children and adults to better define the prevalence, evolution, diagnosis, and treatment of local allergic rhinitis. There, of course, is also food-induced gustatory rhinitis. Um, more commonly, uh, particularly in adults, this is where you have a rhinorrhea problem immediately after food ingestion. It's a cholinergic process. Uh, although hot, spicy foods may be more likely to cause it, it can occur with any uh, foods in some patients. Also, uh, by definition, this could include uh, nasal congestion that occurs after drinking alcoholic beverages because of the pharmacologic ability of ethanol to cause nasal vasodilation. And I, I think it is sort of problematic, though, when you look at your uh, diagnosis codes for rhinitis, they, took, they do talk about allergic rhinitis due to food. Now, IgE-mediated allergic food allergy as a cause of rhinitis rarely, if ever, occurs unless it's accompanied by symptoms involving other organ systems. And I think there's a great misconception about that. Uh, the reason it's important to recognize food-induced gustatory rhinitis is the treatment um, is uh, not the standard treatment. It includes uh, ipratropium, for instance, for the runny nose. This is a listing of other rhinitis syndromes. I'm just going to read through it quickly. I think we have to be commonly, or rather concerned about the rather commonly occurring rhinitis medicamentosa, where topical decongestants or uh, use of uh, intranasal cocaine can cause uh, rebound congestion. And as we know, there are some patients more commonly in adults who with aspirin and non anti-inflammatory drugs will develop rhinitis symptoms. It's commonly underappreciated that ACE inhibitors, although they are well known to cause cough, 
may also cause rhinitis symptoms. And uh, particularly with uh, more likely adults who are on ACE inhibitors, that should be something you ask about. When did the rhinitis symptoms begin? And was it somewhat uh, in uh, conformance with the introduction of an ACE inhibitor into the medical treatment? There are also other beta blockers in uh, hypertensives uh, that can cause problems. Some women find that oral contraceptives can increase nasal symptoms. And that introduces that there can be various hormonally induced influences for rhinitis symptoms, uh, including rhinitis of pregnancy, which tends to occur in the last trimester. Um, and some women do find that during menstrual cycles, they're more likely to have nasal symptoms. Also keep in mind, there are other issues that can cause nasal symptoms. In uh, more uh, severe acid reflux, you can actually get acid contents from the gastric uh, uh, source splashing up into the nose, like at night, and sometimes during the daytime in people. And so if you have a patient who's got refractory rhinitis and they got some GE reflux symptoms, the GE reflux might be very important to address to get things under control with the nose. Speaking a bit more about rhinitis medicamentosa, because it's not uncommon, it develops pathophysiologically because of downregulation of alpha adrenergic receptors because of chronic stimulation um, with the uh, uh, alpha agonist, the decongestants predominantly. This can be treated with intranasal corticosteroids. Sometimes you do have to use oral steroids and sort of um, have a, um, a period of time where as you're tapering down on the use of the nasal decongestants, you're giving a course of oral steroids. But you know, when somebody's got this, you always have to ask the question, well, why did they get into this problem with the overuse of the nasal decongestants in the first place? Was it because they got some underlying a chronic rhinitis problem? Did they have just an acute onset of nasal congestion after a URI and got hooked uh, after that point with the use of nasal decongestants? This is important to figure out if you're going to really get the patient over their uh, um, need for taking topical nasal decongestants. Also, we have to be mindful that nasal symptoms can occur because of structural or mechanical factors, including septal issues. Usually a septal um, deviation can cause unilateral symptoms, but if you have more of an S-shaped um, uh, nasal septum, that can also cause bilateral uh, congestion. And of course, there are some patients that have very hypertrophic inferior turbinates. Um, children, adenoidal hypertrophy, there can be foreign bodies up there sometimes. And you always have to keep in the back of your mind uh, the possibility of nasal tumors um, with also caloaltresia being another differential consideration. Uh, nasal polyps, I think, are something that have to be always kept in mind. Um, and then more unusual causes of nasal type symptoms would include um, cerebral spinal fluid, CSF rhinorrhea. This is typically unilateral, not always. But if you got presented with a patient who's just got unilateral drainage without other symptoms, you really should be thinking about this. CSF rhinorrhea can occur post-traumatically or spontaneously. You can check the um, nasal discharge for beta-2 transparent level. This is probably a good board question, which is not present in usual nasal secretions, uh, but that would be present in CSF. And you could also look at glucose levels, which would conform to what you'd expect to see with CSF from a spinal tap. Also, we're not going through detail today, but you have to think about weirder things that can be uh, causing nasal symptoms. And that includes everything from Wegener's to midline granuloma, sarcoid, lupus, and Sjogren's. So how do you make the diagnosis of the correct type of rhinitis? History, physical exam, allergy testing if indicated, and potentially other diagnostic testing. Relative to the history, it's important to do a couple of things, not only to make the diagnosis, but to determine what the most bothersome symptoms are so that informs your choice of the medications or the other treatments that you might be giving to the patient. So ask about running nose, nasal congestion, sneezing, and itching, which is, as I've mentioned, itching is less common in non-allergic rhinitis. 
If there are associated eye symptoms, uh, asking about itchy, watery, red, swollen eyes, this suggests more likely that you're dealing with allergic rhinitis. And it also seems to be that allergic rhinitis caused by pollens is more likely to have these associated eye symptoms than allergic rhinitis, um, let's say perennial allergic rhinitis to uh, house dust mites. Also, look at the pattern of the rhinitis to help you select therapy and figure out what's going on. Is it seasonal um, pattern that would fit with, for instance, seasonal pollens? Is it perennial, which makes you think you've got to worry about, obviously, perennial allergens? Uh, I would say when you've got perennial symptoms, that's more of a dilemma as to whether or not you've got allergic or non-allergic because there really is not good, reliable evidence that you can definitively make a good distinction between uh, if you will, perennial non-allergic rhinitis and perennial allergic rhinitis in many cases without testing. Uh, of course, then as we've mentioned, we've got intermittent versus episodic environmental allergic rhinitis or persistent. Ask about home versus work. There are a lot of adults that will have problems uh, going into the workplace that can aggravate their nasal symptoms. Are they worse outdoors? or indoors, suggesting what the uh, potential allergen might be. You can ask about acute symptoms with uh, house dust mites, molds, and pets. I find a very useful question uh, relative to pets is if somebody goes away on vacation uh, for a week or two away from the pets, do they get better? And sometimes, particularly adults, are more forthcoming and, and uh, thoughtful that, oh, yeah, I, I do find that I'm better away from the pets, whereas they may not um, be very mindful of that if they are just being asked acutely if they have any increased symptoms, if they're petting their cat or dog or whatever. Of course, food or gustatory rhinitis, and as I've mentioned, ask about drugs. Ask for non steroidal inflammatories, in particular ACE inhibitors. Uh, if you have on history nasal congestion that's shifting, that's a good thing because that's consistent with the physiologic phenomenon of nasal cycling where blood is shifting from one side to the other, ranging roughly every four to six hours, versus if it's unilateral symptoms, you have to think of an anatomic cause that's uh, entering into the picture. Uh, you should, of course, ask about previous response to other medications tried these days. There's so many over-the-counter things out there. Uh, typically, patients have already tried a number of uh, different agents. Um, but don't just ask whether they've been, for instance, on nasal corticosteroids and not done well, but also ask, well, they were, were they taking it on a daily basis or did they give up the ship after a couple of days or were just using it PRN? I think a common issue with chronic nasal symptoms is making sure you're not dealing with sinusitis. Uh, and here, you know, when did their chronic nasal symptoms begin? Did it begin last fall after they got an upper respiratory infection and they've never gotten away with uh, having, uh, uh, they've still had problems with congestion uh, thereafter? Uh, you could ask, of course, about things about whether they got headache, or purulent drainage, which might steer you more to thinking about sinusitis. But we all know that headache can be a very nonspecific uh, symptom. And even if you're talking specifically about sinusitis, the majority of patients that come in talking about sinus headaches, in fact, don't have a sinus basis to that. Also ask about coexisting conditions, including asthma, whether there's some evidence of sleep apnea uh, and acid reflux. You can, of course, ask about a family history of uh, allergic disease, but, um, you know, it's possible can, people can also have uh, nasal symptoms without allergic disease, and there's a family history of that, so it doesn't always help you as much as you'd think. Looking at physical exam, obviously, with the nose, make sure looking at the septum, there's not significant deviation that you can see. Mindful, you can only see about one-third of the way up if you're just using an otoscope tip. Um, and could be missing something higher up. Look for mucosal ulcers. You want to make sure that the septum doesn't have some ulcers, and, and that's, of course, an issue if you are having a patient who is using um, nasal um, uh, sprays. Uh, look at the turbinates. How swollen are they? Do you think that if you put nose sprays up there, they're going to get anywhere? Sometimes you do have to have somebody advised to take short courses, three to five days of a nasal decongestant spray to open things up enough 
so you can get in your nasal steroids and nasal antihistamines. Look at the nasal mucosa. I don't think this is always, in my experience, really helpful for distinguishing allergic versus non-allergic, although um, certain things like rhinitis medicamentosa are noted, for instance, to have very highly um, erythematous looking boggy mucosa. You should be looking for nasal polyps, examining the eyes, ears, and oropharynx, and then because of the high prevalence of concomitant asthma, doing a uh, lung exam as well. Obviously, specific IgE determination, either by performing skin testing or in vitro testing, can determine the uh, allergies that may be relevant to the individual. You always do want to make a correlation between the test results and the patient history. The reason, of course, we do this is several fold. One would be assisting in the uh, selection of some treatment options, some of which certain medications have absolutely no value for non-allergic rhinitis. You can identify specific allergens that are responsible for symptoms, so this can be useful for advising uh, avoidance measures, and then when appropriate, prescribing targeted allergen immunotherapy. In the big picture of treatment of allergic rhinitis, we're looking at avoidance and environmental control, which I won't discuss further here because there's a separate lecture in the series about that. I will be focusing on pharmacologic therapy, and of course, allergen immunotherapy can be a key part of treatment of allergic rhinitis, but that is a topic that has been handled um, elsewhere in this series as well. So, pharmacologic therapy. What sort of things should you think about uh, choosing medications? Well, do they have allergic or non-allergic or mixed rhinitis? Is it seasonal? And the thought here might be you might consider starting medications before the onset of the anticipated season. And depending on the frequency of symptoms, you might choose medications differently. If it's just intermittent symptoms, you probably want something that's going to be rapidly onset. Uh, if it's persistent symptoms, um, rapid onset is always good. However, if over a number of days or weeks, uh, an agent is actually more effective than an agent with the shorter onset action, you can make a case that for the more persistent patient, slower onset but more effective treatments may be appropriate. In terms of episodic environmental um, rhinitis, so let's say somebody normally doesn't have a cat in their environment, but they're going to relatives where there are cats uh, for some special holiday dinner. Here, pre-exposure prophylaxis can be a very helpful strategy. And nasal chromalin taken just 15 to 20 minutes prior to the uh, exposure can do a good job about reducing the uh, rhinitis that might develop. Um, also, rapid onset agents, uh, relatively speaking, such as um, uh, the uh, oral antihistamines can be uh, helpful as well. Uh, also, what are the most bothersome symptoms? If you've got a patient with prominent nasal congestion, nasal corticosteroids, for instance, are going to be more effective than oral antihistamines or leukotriene receptor antagonists. And if you have somebody already on an agent, but they've got some uh, residual right and rita that needs to be mopped up, that's where nasal ipratropia might be added in. In general, for more severe uh, allergic rhinitis, nasal corticosteroids are going to be more effective um, than uh, a number of the other agents. And also, you do have to keep in mind uh, side effects and uh, also the acceptability of different treatments in different age groups. In kids, you might have difficulty getting them to use nasal sprays. In senior patients, you should avoid first-generation oral antihistamines because of the effect on mentation and possibly increasing fall risk. Um, and also oral decongestants can cause side effects more commonly in that group. And then ultimately, you can say, hey, this would be the, the preferred agent on the basis of effectiveness trials. But you ultimately have to also talk about patient preference what's the cost of the patient, and what's the risk-benefit assessment. And there really does need to be some shared decision-making with the, in the case of kids, parents, uh, and the kid, uh, as well as in adults uh, where you are uh, discussing pros and cons of different options.
So other key points about medications before we start speaking about some specific issues with specific agents. Generally, nasal corticosteroids are your most effective treatment for allergic rhinitis and can also be useful in non-allergic rhinitis. Although some medications can be effective in either allergic or non-allergic rhinitis, be mindful that oral antihistamines, oral antileukotrienes, and nasal chromalin generally are pretty worthless for non-allergic rhinitis and are effective only for allergic rhinitis. That's why it's so important to define how much the patient's issue are allergic versus non-allergic. Also, uh, combination therapy can be considered when monotherapy is not doing the trick. But one of the points I'm going to be making here is that some combinations of medications really are not any better than monotherapy, and you're wasting money, uh, you're wasting patient effort by advocating such strategies. And that's actually one of the points that's going to be coming out um, in a few minutes when I talk about recommendations from the new Joint Task Force uh, uh, Renitis Parameter. When you are giving intranasal preparations to patients, make sure you instruct them about properly avoiding uh, the uh, septum by not uh, going medially towards the septum. Uh, and then also talk about strategies such as uh, nose to toes, for instance, that can reduce uh, runoff um, and uh, uh, thereby um, potentially improve the effectiveness of the nasal sprays by having better retention of the spray in the nose mucosa so it can get absorbed better. Um, for episodic environmental rhinitis or intermittent rhinitis, again, uh, you would prefer a medication with a rapid onset of action. Now, I've mentioned uh, the upcoming rhinitis guidelines. The Joint Task Force Rhinitis Parameter, which I was um, co uh, uh, editor of with uh, Dana Wallace uh, will be coming out shortly. This is a very focused, very evidence-based update on three key questions. Um, the traditional parameter, which still is relevant to most things, is listed there as well from 2008. Then there are the allergic rhinitis and its impact in asthma or ARIA guidelines that um, were last updated uh, in 2010, but are in press in Jackie for a um, new revision and update. There is also a major guideline, the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head Neck Surgery, AAO, h &S guideline that was convened by many, um, well, it was convened by the AAO, h &S, but it had representatives from many organizations, primary care, I represented the academy, uh, Dan Wallace represented the college. And then there is a guideline which uh, was issued by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, uh, AHRQ, in 2013. I will tell you very briefly, I don't think that's too clinically helpful because they set such a high bar for saying that there was a, um, uh, you had to demonstrate such a high bar for distinguishing between the effectiveness of different agents. For the most part, they said that there wasn't really any difference between any of the different rhinitis treatments. Uh, we'll talk about that briefly in passing as we go forward. I do want to point out that we are now evolving to very transparent, very detailed assessment of making recommendations. And for instance, in the in-press Joint Task Force Practice Parameter Update on Rhinitis, um, this is just simply one table for one question which looked at the um, uh, clinical statement saying for initial treatment of moderate to severe seasonal allergic rhinitis in adults, the clinician should recommend an intranasal steroid over a leukotriene receptor antagonist. And as you see on the left-hand side, there's strength of recommendation, what's the quality improvement opportunity, what's the benefit harm assessment, Going further down, what is the quality of the evidence? How much confidence do we have in the level of the evidence? How much did expert opinion come into the deliberations? What were the values, for instance, the, the treatment outcomes assessed in the studies? Uh, would those be valued as important by most patients? Sometimes you want to intentionally have a vague recommendation because you want to give more latitude but in this situation, it was thought vagueness was not appropriate. Talking about 
patient preferences? Are there some subgroups that this doesn't apply to? Um, which should be a policy level? Uh, if you're talking about uh, national uh, uh, standards and, and medical care, and then were the differences of opinion. So I do want to make the point that as we go forward with evidence-based analysis, there is very detailed uh, uh, transparency of all these different considerations. This brings up the question about what is a minimal clinically important difference uh, for um, uh, rhinitis improvement. Ideally, of course, if we had the best of all possible worlds, you'd want to have objective measurements that could be used. But it turns out, in the case of rhinitis, when you look at objective measurements, like peak nasal inspiratory flow is an example, or uh, even fancier things like rhino um, manometry, which are looking at airflow, or looking at uh, acoustic rhinometry, which actually can look at the 3D structure of how much area there is within the nose. Those don't always track well with what uh, are really more relevant to patients, and that's their symptoms. So the total nasal symptom score, which is a 12-point scale um, that uh, is based on considerations such as uh, rhinorrhea, congestion, uh, sneezing, um, that is really the FDA's preferred method of determining drug efficacy and is thought to be the best tool although this doesn't necessarily capture things about improvement of quality of life. But there's not even, for the total nasal symptom score, TNSS, a uh, universal threshold as to, okay, so many X points of improvement in total nasal symptom score means it's clinically important. And I'm not going to go through this for the purposes this morning, but there are different ways you can determine this statistically or based on whether... Um, particular threshold of patient symptom reduction can lead to a, um, a patient-related score of well-being difference. Just be aware that this is a problem with the guidelines because they're looking maybe to see whether something was statistically significantly different. But then the question is, all right, between those two treatments, was it really to a magnitude that's going to make an impact to patients? Okay, now some questions. According to the Joint Task Force, which of the following agents is not recommended for a patient with episodic environmental allergic rhinitis? Your choices would be an oral antihistamine, intranasal antihistamine, intranasal corticosteroid, or oral antileukotriene. So looking at this, these are all agents that could be used for allergic rhinitis, but because we're looking at episodic allergic rhinitis, we want something that's got a rapid onset of action. Here's a listing of different classes of drugs that could be used and their onset of action. And as you go down the list and see oral antihistamines rapid within hours, nasal antihistamines within 15, 30 minutes, nasal steroids, some within three to four hours, perhaps 12 hours onset, and nasal chromalin, if you took it pre-exposure, it would help within uh, protecting within actually minutes. Leukotriene receptor antagonists occur um, uh, statistically with uh, improvement after the second day, so that's not recommended for that context. Speaking of nasal steroids, again, uh, these are the most effective monotherapy for allergic rhinitis. They can help with nasal congestion. Uh, they can be useful for PRN administration, although the formal studies that uh, looked at this, including one that I was lead author on, um, it ended up that patients were actually ending up uh, the nasal steroids uh, more than 50% of days of use. Uh, also, if you're looking at comparisons between different treatment options, uh, monotherapy with nasal steroids, uh, most studies would say, is more effective than combo therapy of an oral antihistamine and a leukotriene receptor antagonist for allergic rhinitis. Nasal steroids do have an onset of action that's less rapid than oral or intranasal antihistamines, as we've just talked about. Uh, they could, though, be considered for episodic allergic rhinitis. Uh, because they do work within hours or 12 hours. Uh, 
Uh, part of this actually may be the vasoconstrictive action of the uh, nasal decongest or the nasal steroids. Um, as you may be aware, when you are measuring the relative potency of corticosteroids, um, some models are used with uh, skin vasoconstrictor assays in animals to assess that. And so that vasoconstrictor effect could be what's explaining some of the early uh, onset of benefit with the nasal steroids. Uh, interestingly, if you're trying to help a patient with their ocular symptoms of allergic rhinitis, Oral antihistamines, monotherapy head-to-head -head with nasal corticosteroids are about equally effective. Um, you should also keep in mind that nasal steroids can be useful for non-allergic rhinitis. I sometimes get um, misunderstanding from trainees who think that, oh, well, nasal antihistamines are better for non-allergic rhinitis. That's not necessarily true. Uh, and then nasal steroids, therefore, could be useful for both allergic and non-allergic rhinitis together as mixed rhinitis. The local side effects of nasal steroids are relatively minimal, but they can be important in some patients who seem to have particularly problems with nosebleeds. Sometimes you can change from one preparation to another. Uh, sometimes it just can't be tolerated. Although it doesn't happen very often, you do have to be mindful that there is the possibility of nasal septa perforation that can occur. My own preference is to make sure that once I've started a patient on a nasal steroid, I see them back uh, within a couple of months, I'll make sure the nasal mucosa looks okay, and then I can put them on a longer leash of um, more um, uh, uh, or less frequent follow-up. Relative to systemic side effects in adults, you really don't have issues uh, of, uh, let's say, bone marrow or bone thinning or diabetes, which sometimes comes up as a question, or hypertension. There's generally pretty reassuring data about cataracts and increased intraocular pressure. Uh, there may be some individual patients that have, for whatever reason, um, increased susceptibility to that, but that is generally not considered to be a major issue. Now, in kids, you don't see HPA axis suppression, but there are growth issues. Um, the data is mixed. Some of it's reassuring, and I would also say it somewhat depends on methodology um, as to how you are looking at whether the growth is being reduced or not. The upshot of this, though, is if you look even though with um, the FDA labeling for over-the-counter status of all nasal steroids, uh, there is now class labeling uh, so that when someone goes to the drugstore, picks up their over-the-counter nasal steroid, it says the growth rate of some children might be slightly slower. If the child needs to use the spray for longer than two months a year, the parent should talk to the child's doctor. What I think this means, though, in translation for us is that we should be measure, uh, measuring rather than following the, uh, the child's uh, growth. Uh, make sure that that is not um, being reduced. Now, in the whole context of everything, though, um, if you're looking at systemic effects on growth from inhaled corticosteroids for asthma in children, that is much more of an issue than nasal corticosteroids. But as I say, we're not totally off the hook with nasal steroids in kids and growth either. Oral antihistamines, turning to another option, um, are most effective when they're used continuously, do have a relatively rapid onset of action. Um, for years now, the guidelines have recommended against the use of first-generation or sedating agents, and this is for a variety of reasons. This is that, number one, uh, performance impairment, such as driving, can occur that is not being perceived by the patient. And this might be equivalent to alcohol inebriation. Even though diphenhydramine, for instance, is sometimes used uh, deliberately at bedtime to help with sleep, um, Dr. Estelle Simons makes the point that this can lead to disturbed sleep architecture, deep sleep, light sleep, REM sleep, and that's not really desirable. Also, some patients, uh, particularly adults, are more um, susceptible to adverse anticholinergic effects such as dry mouth and uh, urinary retention. Uh, 
There is a demonstrated increased risk for falls in senior patients on first-generation antihistamines. There is also a more recently raised concern that there's greater risk for dementia from anticholinergic agents in seniors, and that includes the first-generation antihistamines. So, uh, second-generation oral antihistamines would be generally preferred for treatment of rhinitis, and I've listed all these here. And be mindful that for some of the agents, for example, there with fexofenadine, you can even go to higher than prescribed doses without evidence of um, uh, impairment. In that case, uh, fexofenadine is azwitterine, and probably because of that, doesn't cross over the blood-brain bar barrier very effectively. Oral decongestants, of course, can cause uh, adverse effects, uh, more commonly an issue in adults with hypertension, but you can see in adults and kids, insomnia, anxiety. Um, the pseudoephedrine behind-the-counter availability uh, agent is probably more effective than phenylephrine, which is available over-the-counter. Um, and one thing you have to keep in mind, though, when you're dealing with um, pregnant women or women of uh, childbearing age is that there is an increased risk of gastroschisis, uh, closing of the abdominal cavity, uh, when these uh, oral decongestants are used in the first trimester of pregnancy and therefore would be avoided in such uh, women. Relative to nasal agents, um, the nasal decongestants are generally more effective than the oral agents and can uh, avoid the cardiovascular and CNS side effects that we just talked about. But as we know from discussion a num number of minutes ago, you can get into rhinitis medicamentosa. Um, and there is some evidence, though, if you have concomitant administration of nasal steroids with nasal decongestants over a number of weeks, that can uh, avoid um, the development of rhinitis medicamentosa. We do need some longer-term studies going over months uh, that would demonstrate whether that same um, uh, protective effect of the nasal steroids is uh, still present. Relative to intranasal antihistamines as a class, these are less effective than intranasal steroids for nasal symptoms. However, right there, I'm going to make a little caveat. You know, when we're talking about guidelines and comparative trials and we're looking at one drug compared to another drug, you do have to be mindful that although these may be mean differences in responses, there might be individual patients who do respond better to one agent than another, even though they wouldn't be predicted to on the basis of mean responses. So I say this because there are patients who will say that they get more benefit from an intranasal antihistamine um, than an intranasal corticosteroid. So keep in mind the individualized uh, uh, importance of responses. Uh, nasal uh, antihistamines can help nasal congestion. The FDA does have official indication approved for, quote, vasomotor rhinitis for nasal azelastine. Um, and the uh, other advantage of intranasal antihistamines is they have, as we've mentioned earlier, a rapidly, uh, a relatively rapid onset of action. Uh, adverse effects would be predominantly sedation. You can get systemic absorption from these agents and dyspusia, uh, perceived uh, uh, taste uh, uh, problems. Uh, some people say that they're very bitter, but that depends on the patient. If you look at a meta-analysis, to just get away from some text slides here for a bit, and compare on the left-hand side with this four 